For all those that are streaming in, I'm Matthew West. We are one of the co-founders and the CEO of Voice. We're a core compliance monitoring platform for motor finance companies. And I'll be your host today. So fasten your seatbelts as Nick gives us a tour through some of the compliance essentials in the motor finance sector on this Voice podcast. So first of all, Nick, the first thing I wanted to look into is how do you believe recent regulatory changes have impacted motor finance? brokers and lenders in the UK? Well, I think it's the first thing to say is that the motor finance sector is probably more complex than people uh, realise to start with. Uh, What I mean by that is in a lot of financial services, the product provider, in this case the lender, is often dealing directly with the the end user, the consumer, or if you take mortgages and insurance, they're often going through a broker. In the motor finance sector, you've almost always got a dealer in there. Well, by nature, someone's supplying the vehicle, but that's often the point of entry. They then may also be going through a broker before getting to a lender or dealing directly with the lender. So when it comes to consumer duty, for instance, which is the obvious, you know, most recent change, there's a lot of complexity in there as to who governs who, who who's looking at consumer duty, sharing outcomes and many other things. So I think... That's been, you know, obviously consumer duty is the big change, but the big challenge has been how everyone deals with each other to get the right outcomes for customers and who's responsible for it. And I think there's been some big challenges around that in particular. Yeah, that's very interesting. So what I'm hearing is there's essentially three stakeholders instead of two. We've got mm. the traditional brokers and lenders, but now we also have these dealers. And there's challenges as to whose responsibilities lie where and where have you seen overlap there what are some of the examples where you commonly see a it's not my role but it's their role type of situation well i think quite rightly when it came to con- like the lead up to consumer duty doesn't it seem a long way away by the way by the way now i remember getting to yeah. july last year and thinking <laughs> wow this has taken so long to come around and now we're nearly a year down the line so nearly by the way end, it's not really yeah. fast um as we're leading up to April, certainly when the lenders had to put out their price and value assessments, there was a lot of secrecy, I think, around who was going to do what. And we did an exercise of collating all the different documents from all the different lenders to try and, you know, see the commonalities and not. And that was a really complex piece of work. So it was clear that everyone had done their own work on it. I think what that means is that not only had they not shared the information with each other as lenders to get a homogenized kind of approach but they'd also maybe not engage the brokers or the dealers alongside and that's the same as the brokers the brokers may have got some information from the lenders but maybe not from the dealers and dealers quite frankly didn't do much about it you know i'm talking the independent dealers we deal with you know the main dealer groups will have done um so what you had probably as soon as consumer duty was implemented is everyone had had their own, you know, approach. Everyone had, you know, in the large taken it seriously, done the assessments, but they hadn't really worked out how to share data and how that was going to work with each other. So like I think everyone's still now going through that process of going, well, we understand maybe what our consumer duty outcomes should be, but does that actually align with the other, you know, partners we deal with? Mm-hmm. And how quickly are they making changes at the moment? Um, I think people are taking it seriously, is the, is the first thing to say. Um, and just like the FCA have said, it's not a once and, for, and forgotten, and quite rightly so. I think it's still going to be an evolution. I think when we come to this, you know, the, the anniversary, let's say, of consumer duty, and everyone should know if they don't, that, you know, everyone needs a board report on consumer duty outcomes and data and uh, and all that good stuff i think there's going to be a lot more outcomes of that and, and we'll see the holes in like kind of well you know how, how have you shared this information how have you understood what lenders want if you're a broker or a dealer as a lender how have you understood how your brokers or dealers have done the implementation so i think there's been some work on that but i think a lot more will be to come after the first anniversary yeah. and and if you look at the brokers dealers and lenders Who's done the most work so far and where do you think there's room for for work to be done? 
I, I think you need to speak about each of them because I think everyone's done some work. You know, the lenders quite clearly took it very, very seriously. You know, everyone had their price and value assessments in on time. Um, some of them were absolutely excellent. Some were a bit more bare bones, you know, um, and, you know, and that was shared in a, re in a really good way. But I don't think the lenders on the whole have done a great um, great deal of making sure that the brokers and dealers have done absolutely everything they should. What we are seeing now, actually, though, is lenders um, pushing brokers, certainly, to do a lot more oversight of their dealers, where it's that kind of, you know, dealer introduced to broker, introduced to lender arrangement. So, for instance, I know some of the brokers are now being asked to, you know, to get copies of information notices that the uh, that the that the dealers are given um brokers we found kind of left it a little bit late last year some of them not the not the biggest ones but you know some of the medium-sized brokers and you, you know there's a lot of them mm. some of them came to us and said well you know can we do this exercise and we only had maybe three or four months left you know till till, till the deadline um they took it very very seriously at that point at least and you know we have conversations all the time about consumer duty outcomes which is really good and certainly in our market, which is the independent dealers mostly, um, the dealers want to follow the lead of what the broker or the lender says, maybe not even what we what we say. So, you know, we're continuing now in engaging with lenders and brokers to go, you know, what more do you want rather than just what we think the FCA want? And the dealers are starting to come around. But ultimately, it all gets led by what the lenders do. And if the lenders, have set, you know, say, we need everything to be perfect, the brokers and the and the dealers will follow, but they probably won't always do it off their own back. Off their own back. Do you, do you think it's it's if if we look at the a, a credit broker versus a dealer and the amount of money that is made off of a sale? Hmm. My my understanding is a dealer makes far more for a sale of a car than a, than than the the credit broker. Um. But the responsibility then lies more on the credit broker to make sure that customer was given the right outcome. Do you think that's fair or do you think it it's, should balance more towards the dealer? Isn't it? Because I, I, I think there's two sides of looking at this. If you look at the whole transaction value, so you look at the, you know, the actual margin in the vehicle, any associated services, any unregulated products, and then the finance commission, yes, the dealer makes more money. If you look at just the finance commission, it may well be the broker. And, you know, and in the past, the FCA would have said, well, it's the person making the commission, you know, or, or making the interest on the loan as the lender that's the most important party. But what consumer duty does, of course, is tie in everything that's unrelated to not only that sale, but other sales. Um, but. I'm not sure I'm allowed to swear, so I'll say the proverbial yeah. feces flows yeah. downwards. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, that's what they say, yeah. isn't it? It rolls downhill. Yeah. And I think if you then look at things like the differential commission arrangements, um, you know that that's being targeted yeah. absolutely at the lenders to start with to roll down, and yeah. you know we'll probably jump in the gun onto something else we might talk about, but it's. Yeah. Um, if the lender's going to take the first brunt, the broker's going to take the second brunt, and the dealer's going to take the last brunt. And ultimately, you know, the FCA will always deal with the biggest firms. They'll always come down on the hard, on, hardest on the biggest firms because they're the ones who can pay the fines, I'm afraid. Mm. And, and then when they come down on the, biggest, on the biggest firms, are you seeing certain some dealers sort of getting treated you know, more of because of their size compared to every dealers. So are certain no. dealers on the... No, I mean, it, that does happen, you know, with the big franchise groups. You know, there's been yeah. some, I won't say it, mention names, yeah. but there's been, you know, some investigations that we see into into big dealer groups. Um, but what we do see, and, you know, we deal with some of the smallest firms yeah. offering, offering yeah. finance, is that the FCA are asking for more and more requests, more and more reports. Um, newly authorized firms especially are coming under a lot more scrutiny um, whereas I think you know under consumer duty for instance the FCA are expecting that the other stakeholders the lenders and the brokers are you know taking that oversight and encouraging the dealers to do more um, 
where you know they're you know they're still getting more reports to do, but probably aren't getting the same level of scrutiny that a new firm would be. Okay, fantastic. So it sounds like you know the you'll have an easier time being a dealership than a credit broker in in the consumer duty. From a compliance point of view, yeah, and 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 that's probably right. You know, although we're talking that you know that a dealer may more, yeah. may make more money, their main business is not financial services. That is secondary to you know make an introduction. What dealers do need to do and should do is take very seriously that introduction because customer, yeah. although it's not an advised sale, the customers do listen to their what they would feel is a recommendation. That could be who they're yeah. introducing them to what product they're introducing them to, you know, and um, they need to take that, even if it's a small part of the business, they need to take that small part very seriously to make sure, you know, yeah. the customer is getting the right outcomes. And, and when you see outcomes going wrong, that takes me to the second point around compliance challenges. Hmm. Where in the journey do you see those outcomes going wrong? Is it at what point does the customer fall under detriment? You might find this surprising, but from a dealer point of view, I think it's whether they've picked the right partners in the first place. We still see yeah. and hear instances where a small, you know, each smaller car dealers will say, um, I use a broker. And, you know, the great thing with brokers often is they'll have a panel of lenders. The dealer hasn't got to worry about, you know, who's the right lender for the customer. A lot of that works done in the background very well by the broker. But then they'll say, oh, but I still use a, one single lender first before the broker. And we'll go, okay, why is that? Are they offering a better rate? Is it a better service? Is it faster? And they'll be like, oh, no, I've known the rep for 10 years and uh, they pay me more commission. And you'll say, so, but the rate must be better for the customer. No, no, the rate's higher. And you're like, that's not allowed. Um, and so there's still a lot of learning to do there. And that won't happen everywhere. But ultimately, the dealer has often chosen who to, to deal with, not because of the right thing for customers, but for the right thing for their business. Just on that point of it not being allowed, can you just elaborate on, on that? Because it, what I'm hearing now with this discretionary commission and the comp, you know, bat essentially banned when they banned it it was almost like it was better to not ban it because then you gave the ability to set the commission down to um you know closer to the customer the yeah, customer actually not, would it's let's, let's not, it's, that's a whole other podcast that we probably should, okay. should do that uh, the, the question but of at, whether at a high level explain to the viewers yeah just I, to touch I, on that a bit. i think the I won't give my view, but I'll give the argument. Yeah. The argument yeah. is simply that post differential commission agreements being um, banned, overall customers have paid more for finance on average. That's a simple fact, and people have data on that. So whether the ban is effective is very much up in the air. Um, but you know, on an individual basis, certainly dealers can't change the commission. That sounds like a good thing. But whether it saved customers money is a is a different argument. But um, yeah, on the on, on the business of why that's not allowed, it's simply that you you've got to be given the best outcome for the customer, and that's not always the lowest rate. By the way, it's not always the lowest APR. It could be that a customer really needs a vehicle quickly, and therefore the agreement might be slightly more expensive but quicker to inset. That's valid if it's true. It could be that the total amount pay, payable is lower. Um, if you take a PCP, the payment might be lower on one, but the balloon may be lower, and therefore there might not be an equity at the end of the loan. So, there are, you know, there are a lot of circumstances to consider. But certainly if you're using one lender at 13.9% APR and you're sending every customer there, the customer's going to believe that that is the best rate that you can offer. If you've then got a broker that can do 9.9, .9, but you're not using them because you can make more commission from the first lender, unless you can, you know, realistically prove that the customer wanted to pay that higher rate for a valid reason, that's absolutely not giving the right outcome to the customer. Mm. And how can some firms prove that they're not doing that? 
I think the question, Matthew, is are they being oh. asked to prove that they're not doing that? And I'm not saying this is widespread, but I'm saying we hear enough of it that it certainly goes on. Um, and this is where we go back to that point of are the FCA asking for that data directly? No, they're not. But where lenders and brokers are aware that that's happening, and I would call on lenders who know that they're the first string to be checking, is that dealer using another broker or using a broker at a lower rate? And really, should your rate be set higher if you know that dealer's using you first line? You know what I mean? That is, That should be you know, falling foul of avoiding foreseeable harm, shouldn't it? Mm, definitely. You know, this is something which maybe exists and something which, you know, if it doesn't, it would seem quite trivial as a solution, but it's just to, that the consumer should have two options always hmm. and always be presented with two two options. That's similar when a, in a large enterprise buys software, they need multiple quotes. Is that something which would be a, a way to prove that customers are given, you know, I, 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 fair... I think customers should be given all quotes. I don't yeah. think it's too difficult with technology now to do that. So, for instance, we have technology off the back of some of our compliance systems and the, some of the plugins that we use often say, well, do you want to just display the best quote? And my argument is, well, what's the best quote? Let's display all the quotes. And the customer can then go, well, do I want a PCP or an HP? You know, do I want lowest APR, lowest total amount payable, lowest payment? And then let them see which is which and let them see the detail. And I think, you know, anyone offering finance needs to ensure they have the right level of knowledge and training to be able to explain those to customers so that customers can make an informed decision. And Nick, when it comes to the compliance challenges, so yes, we mentioned that it's the relationships that the, at the, 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 the dealers have formed. Often that is the start of it looking at loyalty and and working with people that they've worked for for a very long time, best for them, not necessarily best for the customer. What other compliance challenges are you seeing motor finance firms face today? I think uh, this probably goes for all firms. The, the yeah. biggest difficulty in motor finance has been identifying vulnerabilities. Um, I think it's very easy in some industries where this is what we probably call a slower sale, to to identify that so if you take a mortgage for instance no one expects a mortgage to be approved in minutes and paid out in an hour so if you were to ask a mortgage broker to go through a detailed analysis of the customer you know which they often already do with financial information but you know from a checking vulnerabilities point of view and you say i'm going to do a full assessment that's going to take 15 minutes as a percentage of the sale that's a very small amount of, of time I think in motor finance, what a lot of people are doing is like, well, how are we supposed to identify vulnerability? And if you take one of the, you know, the FCA's measures of, I'll call it roughly half of the customers may be vulnerable at some point under certain circumstances. I don't know of any firms in consumer credit who are measuring anywhere near 50% vulnerability. And I'm sure you've got some statistics on what you mm. find with your software, yeah. but I, th I, I would say even with yours, I'm, I'm going to hazard a guess people don't get to 50%. Um, Not and I think that's a challenge because, you know, it, and I think the other challenge is a mental challenge where people think if I identify vulnerability, I can't give this person a loan or I can't sell them a car. And that's absolutely not what's trying to be done. But that's absolutely a challenge in both identifying vulnerabilities and enabling journeys based off, you know, people's circumstances. Yeah. It, what we what we see is is definitely a you know in the credit broker space, a sales agent won't want to report it because they're worried they'll lose out on the opportunity. So it's a it's it, you know that's I think it ties down into the commission that they're going to get. We in our software, we log at the moment, it's around 8% of, 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 of sales calls to credit broker. We see have a vulnerability. And mm -hmm. surprising to a lot of our clients has been the nature of those vulnerabilities. So we see a lot of people saying they are disabled and they need a car that can cater for their extra needs and they, need, and they can't go view the car, so they need a delivery. And mm -hmm. for companies to, to realize that, 
before you know we came along i don't think many of them knew what percentage of their customer base was of such a unique uh <clears throat> need i don't think a lot of them would have understood what vulnerability gen generally is and i know you'll have heard me say this before Matthew, yeah. but i hate the word vulnerability i think it's the worst choice of word because if i ask you are you vulnerable it's it's a it's a really negative word no one wants to be vulnerable um mm -hmm. if i ask do you have any specific needs that i might be able to help you with that's a positive and i, I think often people need to change the word in in order to change the identification of it definitely yeah that, that is a great way to say do you have any sort of you know extra you know extra needs or anything else i can do to support you you further the vulnerability term also some clients but also themselves not want to disclose it so it's how do you hmm. kind of get them to to share without them being worried that it's going to impact their the success of the application one thing we're doing so you know you mentioned we do authorization work so we have that whole yeah. lot of you know, especially independent motor dealers get authorized for finance and the FCA, you know, are now beefing up that, well, have beefed up that process that the bar of getting authorized is much higher. So we do a lot of coaching with the applicants, you know, of what they should know. And if we ask an applicant, what do you think vulnerability is? There's two, two answers and it's the same every time. One is customer as credit issues or mental health issues. And they're the only two things they think at the outset are, are, are vulnerabilities. And then we, when we go through and go, what about life events? Has someone got divorced, even married, had children, a bereavement, whatever that might be, you know, or um, are they hard of hearing or, you know, wh whatever it might be. People eyes are open to their own vulnerabilities, you know, and 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 what you know what things may affect them, and what we're finding is is training and coaching and understanding of vulnerability really opens up a lot. It doesn't identify stuff in the journey, by the way, which is why we're such a big fan of your yeah. your technology, yeah. but it does open up the minds of the people running the op the the organisations to why they should be helping and not just seeing it as an FCA box. Mm -hmm. definitely and one way i like to think about it the definition of of if we use the word vulnerability is is can that person make a decision in three ways can they make the decision unaided can they remember it can they afford it mm -hmm. and those are those are the three criteria which I, we found particularly useful to explain to agents from a training perspective of how to think about identifying vulnerability can they make a decision unaided remember it and afford it yeah okay. nick when it comes to some examples of sort of catastrophes or you know significant consequences for for firms have you seen any recently um and could you you know share an example with our viewers I'm not sure about catastrophes, but certainly the burden, I think, of compliance can almost feel like a catastrophe. Um, I mean, you, I suppose you could argue that, you know, the DCA complaints or the gap insurance stuff yeah. that's going on it has certainly some significant events. But I think more than anything, people just need to be prepared for compliance events. You know, it, it, compliance is often seen as an afterthought and something that can be you know, either done once and forgotten or it's just a tick along part. But, you know, when, when a compliance event comes on, whether that's the FCA throwing a spanner in the works, as I'd call it, or a data breach or, you know, whatever that might be, um, people need to be prepared for it. And, and, and my big best advice to people is just, just you know, do that planning ready for the worst because it's uh, – it, compliance can't be an afterthought, I'm afraid, because it will. Yeah. Yeah, if, if profitability is the only thing that's important to you, compliance also has to be important because it will kill your, pro your profitability when, yeah. a, when an event comes along. Prevention definitely better than cure. Hmm. Definitely. The old what? Yeah, <laughs> I couldn't resist. Nick, one thing which, which I saw earlier today, made a company, they've put together 100 agents getting ready to to jump on the commission disclosure mm -hmm. um, and they used to work in the PPI space. 
and they've hired a hundred people. They've got all the outbound phone systems ready and they, they're looking forward to the end of the year to start dialing. And, mm. uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I think they're vultures is, is the, is the top of it. I, uh, I, 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 I think there was some harm to some customers. You know, there, there were certainly circumstances where some customers were charged more than they should have been because of their lack of understanding, let's say. That's a problem. But, you know, in in general, most dealers didn't do that. Um, the claims companies will always do what the regulator allows them to do. Um, and it's a good way, you know, the, the regulator has a love-hate relationship with claims management companies. They don't like the fact that they, you know, take money out of customers' pockets. They do like the way that that helps them to deliver the message of, you know, any perceived wrong wrongdoing and help customers to get recompense for it. Um, but, you know, it, it was going to happen. And if it wasn't that, it was the diesel emission scam. If it wasn't that, it was uh, PCPs. It, it's always going to be something. And that just goes back to my last point of you've got to be prepared and have the right processes yeah. in place to deal with these things. That, that, that leads me to the next point. So you mentioned prevention, be prepared. What warning signs or sort of cracks um, would you recommend companies look out for in their in their internal operations and the kind of governance frameworks at the moment that are signs that they're not prepared? I think if we take that point in, in, in isolation, complaints policy and complaints process are, are two things. So the FCA, obviously, straight away when the DCA announcement came out, said you need to change your complaints process to allow for the, you know, the cooling off put period, let's call it, or the difference between a DCA complaint and not a DCA complaint. and um, I don't think the FCA understood the whole impact of that because it was a, a bigger impact on us than the actual firms. Uh, for instance, the firms just had to change a document. We had to change our entire software system to handle the complaints in a different way, you know, like add a different category, add different timescales. But, you know, I, I think if you're an individual firm, one, make sure your complaints policy is robust, make sure it's trained out to anyone who could have customer contact. And um, just be, you know, just be confident in how you're going to deal with each complaint. We still get calls daily saying, I've had a complaint from either a claims management company or it's come down from the, the ombudsman via a lender or broker. What do I do? And, you know, we help people. But I always question, like, why don't you know what to do? You know, you really should know how to deal with a complaint in your business, the time scales. We don't judge people. You know, we we, we, we deal with everyone and, and help everyone. But, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same, same thing again and expecting a different result. Well, you know, you know you're going to get claims. So, you know, when you've dealt with the first one, make sure you know what you're doing with the second one, that's for sure. And And in terms of the liabilities, like across the dealer's, brokers and lenders where is how is it shared with specifically with these dcas well the fca of the fca have made it very clear that everyone is responsible for their own complaints um so if a, if a dealer or a broker gets a complaint they have to handle it not just fob it off to the lender and the same obviously for the lender um however they've also kind of I don't know if they've made it clear, but they've certainly insinuated that the lender is the person who put that DCA arrangement into place with the dealer and allowed the customer to borrow at a certain rate. So they're going to get the brunt of it. I think the question then is going to be, do the lenders under their dealer you know, agreements go down to the dealers or the brokers and, and ask for some of that money back? Um, I'm not sure. It sounds mm. like cutting off the head of the golden goose to me. It's very interesting times. What do you foresee with this Lloyd's 450 million? I saw they put aside. Do you think that's enough? Uh, no, not, not if you look at the, like the value of the PPI claims and what they ended up putting. I can't remember the figures, but I, I think it was something like people ended up, ended up paying out like three times what they provisioned for to start with. Um, 
I, I, I think I'm, I understand why they've done it. And, and obviously it's public because they're PLCs, but it kind of almost gives the FCA green light to, to, to give some, um, you know, some recompense to customers, the fact that it's been put aside. Um, so it seems almost inevitable that something will come out of it, you know, whether we agree or not. Uh, definitely led to the, a few more claims management companies being incorporated. Hmm. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Nick, w- when we look at, you know, back to sort of the commission piece, could you just explain to the viewers in, initially, you know, initially what, where was the wrongdoing there? So say a customer does end up paying more than they should have. Why was that wrong? Uh, and, and it perhaps equated to another industry and business. If you go buy a pair of shoes from two different retailers, the one could charge you more for the shoes. Mm. Why in the car finance sector is it particularly wrong? Well, I'll tell you first what, why it was wrong under FCA rules. That's yeah. the boring bit. And then I'll give you yeah. the kind of the, yeah. the caveat to that. So what the rules state is not that you couldn't charge an amount above the base rate, but if that agreement was in place, if it materially affected um, where you chose to place the business, or whether the customer's decision to proceed or proceed with that product would have been affected by the existence or nature of commissions. So that's the fact that was commissioned there or the fact that they knew that it would be the difference between, you know, let's say a base rate and a charge out rate. Then you had to disclose that, that the commission was there. And then upon request, the amount if asked. And that didn't happen, basically. The caveat to that is well if you look at one of the FOS complaints i'm going to get these numbers wrong but i'm going to say the base rate was 2.9 percent is what you know the dealer's base rate with the lender was and they charged out i think it was 4.9 percent or 4.99 so let's just take 4.9 so there was a two percent rate spread the argument is is that the d the customer could have got 2.9 the counter argument to that is no one got 2.9 And the lender knew that no one was going to get 2.9. And if they did, the base rate would have been set higher. Now, how a lot of these arrangements were made is that the dealer didn't get 100% of the difference. They often got 50 or 75% of the difference. So the lender always actually made more than they would have done at 2.9%. And so if that arrangement wasn't there, the base rate might it might have been lower than 4.9, but it would have been higher than 2.9. And the further argument to that is, if the dealer wasn't making as much out of the commission, would the price of the car be more? Would the customer have got as much of a discount? Would they've got a service plan? Or, you know, the deal in its, in, in its entirety needs to be look, looked at rather than just the cost of the loan. So there's a lot more to looking at this than just what was the base rate, what was the charge out rate. Wow. So there's also second order effects there as well on that consumer. Well, that, that potentially would be could the walk out the comp. Yeah. Yeah. That would be the defense. Yeah. And in terms of the future for the next sort of 12 months ahead, how do you see the regulation landscape evolving and where is the next kind of DCA? Oh, who knows? It's uh, it's the middle of March and it feels like 2024 should have finished by now. It feels like we've had 12 months of regulation changes and things to deal with in, you know, probably the first two months of the year. So <laughs> I will answer your question. Um, we're going to see what the outcome of the gap insurance investigation is going to be. That's going to, you know, come in the next 12 months and who can continue selling it. And by the way, that'll have a knock on effect on all other add-ons not just in not just insurance regulated not just regulated add-ons but non-regulated add-ons the fca are already looking at things like warranty and service plans and stuff like that um and just to give a bit of background i think although they're not regulated products because of consumer duty a regulated firm has to also look at its unregulated products and that and, and look at them in line with that so that's why that's coming under scrutiny We'll get the outcome of the DCA complaints. Um, We'll have the outcome of the first anniversary of consumer duty and what people have done and not done. And, and, you know, if you look at what happened with gap insurance, for instance, the reason that is come to a fore 
is because certainly post consumer duty that the insurers had a uh, responsibility to make sure that there was price and value in those products the fca decided there wasn't and not enough had been changed and they took action well if we get past the end of july and the fca check board reports which they will do and then see there's not enough action's been taken on other areas we're going to see the same repeated and this won't just be dca from you know up to the start of 2021 this may be what's currently going on with price and value so the it's going to be a busy 12 months that's for sure cool. nick in in closing if you had one compliance tip for the industry what would it be um we'll keep it in line with consumer duty and we did this with a, quite a few brokers and found it very powerful is map your customer journey start to finish that's from any touch points in marketing all the way to post sale communications and especially anything in the middle where you're speaking to customers if you look at the four consumer duty areas and the three cross cutting rules and look at each point of your journey you will automatically find your own improvements and what i promise people is you won't just find com um improvements for consumers you'll actually find improvements in profitability and areas that you can you know um sell more and make more money so it's uh we've always found that a really good thing, exercise to do don't just see compliance as a, a pain in the yeah. ass see it as a, a way of improving your business fantastic so so mapping out the journey it will pay dividends in the general performance of your business hmm. when it comes to monitoring you know that journey that you've not got a map now and you have the experience mapped how would you recommend firms monitor to make sure that the journey is going according to plan for all of the customers? Well, I mean, yeah, that's actually the second part of that exercise, you know. Yeah. So, you know, once you know what your outcome should be at each touch point, you've then got to go, how do we measure it? Like, again, when we did that exercise, people were like, oh, I'm already doing all these things. We're like, great. Can you prove it? And that was often the sticking point. So, you know, it, it may be easy to track how many customers are using a certain product. It's very difficult to understand, does a customer understand what you're explaining? You know, are there any vulnerabilities? You know, what do your complaints mean? And, ha ha you know, how should you feed that back to, you know, improve the start of the process? That's the difficult bit. If you haven't got data, you know, find someone who, who can help you with the data. Do you know of anyone, Nick? Yeah, me and you. <laughs> but <laughs> that, 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 well, that's not a loaded statement. You know, I, I always yeah. say I don't look after our own IT support because, I, you know, we wouldn't, we, that's not our speciality. You know, we it's, don't do our own yeah. telecom. That's not our speciality. Yeah. We don't do our own HR, actually. We have our external HR. I wouldn't want to do that. Um, but, you know, if you can't do it within your firm, you should outsource, you know, and, and that goes for compliance. Mm -hmm call monitoring and, and maybe other things too. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Nick, for, for joining us. It's been really great to have you. And I'm sure everyone watching this will really find a lot of value. And if they need to get hold of you, how can they do that, Nick? Uh, find us online, the Compliance Guys, LinkedIn, Facebook, website, etc. Uh, or me personally on LinkedIn, Nick McDonald. Um, we never charge for a chat. So if anyone wants to pick up the phone and chew the fat about compliance, Let's do it. And um, yeah, good luck, everyone, with Fantastic. the next 12 months. Fantastic, Nick. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Thank you.